He's uh, braver than I on the, the uh, tempting the demo gods. I'm glad it worked out for him. Um, like I said before, I do have some, some secret footage of him from the first summit that we can, we can put on the Twitters. Um, now, next up, one of my favorite people, Lou Tucker, is going to be coming out. And, you know, I'm kind of a Lou Tucker fanboy. Um, there's a rumor going around that I have a Lou Tucker tattoo, and it's like, you know, I can't confirm or deny, but... Before he's gonna come out and actually blow our minds with his talk, we have a quick video from Cisco where he is employed. New opportunities, new technologies, untapped potential for your business. Everyone is moving to the cloud, but what are you supposed to do today? You want speed and agility. You wanna build applications with the latest technologies. Makes sense, but what about control and security? Because here's the thing, Whatever the future holds, cloud today is complicated. Cisco helps you reimagine your cloud world. Need to span any cloud? Done. Any workload environment? Done. Any application type? Done. Combine physical and virtual. No handoffs, no trade-offs. And getting to the Cisco multi-cloud world gives you the freedom to build, to consume, to deliver cloud and manage services your way. That kind of freedom brings opportunity to innovate with speed and agility, with control and security. Anything is possible in a multi-cloud world. This is the future of cloud. This is Cisco. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lou Tucker. Walking out to a live band, you Mark, you're really right, and thanks, thanks so much for that. So as we all know, OpenStack is open source software that allows anybody to build and operate their own public or private cloud. And so we've been talking for a long time, actually, about the, the real values of open source and, and the economic advantages, but I'm beginning to think it goes much, much deeper. And in fact, I think it's actually a core part of what we are as human beings, using our imagination to be able to come up with software paradigms and distribute them and share them with the rest of the community. I started thinking about this when I heard Yuval Harari talk. He was talking about actually that humans control the planet, not because we're the, the biggest, not because we're the fastest, but because we're the only animals that can really cooperate in a very flexible manner in very, very large numbers. And so this is the unique capability that we have that has allowed us to actually operate at a global scale. In fact, two million years ago, when humans spread out from Africa to Eurasia, there were a number of human species. And we were actually a number of different bands of hunter-gatherers. And for hundreds of thousands of years, not much changed. We weren't that impressive. But then 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens appeared. And with Homo sapiens, things started to change very quickly. And around 70,000 years ago, something happened that some scientists call a kind of cognitive revolution. There may have been some rewiring of the brain structures, but whatever it was, wherever Homo sapiens went, we started to take over the environment. We pushed, unfortunately, several species to extinction, including our other human species. But what we were putting into replace was actually using our imagination and using our cognitive powers, our social skills, and organizational abilities to create a new future whereby instead of nature affecting us through natural selection, we were now in charge of our own destiny in creating cultures and the institutions that we see today. So in fact, using our social and organizational skills and imagination, we started to reimagine the world. We started seeing things such as agriculture come up and culture as we organized larger and larger numbers of people. Religions were created, new ideas were created, and it allowed us to organize human activity at a much, much larger scale. And this has actually been the basis for our technology, which has brought us to our modern day world. 
So, invention and abstraction. Above all, man is an inventor. We're not content to simply accept what nature has provided us. We are creating our own environment. And with this environment, such as the steam engine and factory and computers, we are evolving and in charge of our own destiny. In fact, abstractions, as we all know in the OpenStack community, are at the core of what we do. We have virtual machines. We've got software containers. These don't exist. There's no analogy, analog, in the real world. We create projects which don't exist as well. We create institutions for us to be able to govern the con contributions of code, and we create our own language for that, having reviews and everything else which allow us to accept change. This allows us to organize much, much larger than ever before through software and through these organizational constructs so that we can collaborate with people that we've never seen face to face. In fact, cloud computing is, is perhaps the most recent abstraction that we are, are dealing with. And if for those of you who have tried to explain what is cloud computing to somebody outside of the tech, I think you know very well what I mean. It's quite difficult because we really have abstracted a number of concepts here that those of us in a community understand and we treat as something real every day, but to those outside, have real difficulties with it. In fact, now we're even talking about moving software around in containers. This must really cause problems for other people if they're thinking about normal containers that are shipping around the world today. So software is eating the world, as Mark Andreessen said. It's affecting our very business and radically changing entire industries. And open source, I think, is leading the way in this. And because it really has to do with how we are now dispersing software throughout the world and allowing us to collaborate as never before. And in fact, if you look at the activity on GitHub, where there are 35 million projects, 14 million users, this is operating at a scale never before seen. So coupled, take open source software, combine it with the internet, combine it with our capabilities for imagination and collaboration, and we are truly creating our new world. So in fact, we're seeing the age of software-defined data centers. No longer are we defining a data center simply by the hardware racks that are there and the power consumption. We're using software now to define that data center and to manage it. This gives us agility. This gives us lower cost through automation. We're de-risking our investment by going with open source platforms, and we're bringing out new services like never before. And in fact, I like to talk about it as configuration cabling has now become code. Rather than having people go into data centers and move wires around, we can do this through templates, through software, and this allows us to do it with much less errors and a much faster rate, allowing us to keep up with the, the rate of change that we need in our world. So Cisco, of course, sees tremendous concrete business reasons for open source. And our customers are telling this every day. They favor open modular architectures. They want open solutions. And they're seeing open source platforms are driving a standardization at a much faster rate than the traditional methods of, of industry standards. So today, I want to just go through a few instances to show where Cisco is working in open source. First and foremost, we got involved with OpenStack very early. We joined actually 300 of our, of our fellow stackers in Santa Clara. And since 2011, we've been heavily involved in, an open, in OpenStack itself. And in fact, as vice chairman of the foundation, it's been my pleasure to talk about how with our foundation, we brought together most of the industry leaders together in response to our customers who are asking us to work together to collaborate to create an open platform. Other areas we've seen that simultaneously with OpenStack, we've seen uh, a rising software-defined networking. And so again, we've applied the same kind of a model in open daylight, where we've contributed technology and we are working together with the others in the industry so that we can have a standardized way of looking at software-defined networking and allow vendors nonetheless to, to compete in the marketplace and differentiate with their offerings. We've heard a lot about NFV, and this is of particular importance, uh, to Cisco, we're working with many of our customers, and again, using reference models and working with OPNFV, another organization of both users and of vendors, so that we can get a reference architecture for bringing this technology forward. 
Pushing the limits again in network performance is something that's key to Cisco's strategy. And here is where we've released open source software for, for called virtual packet processing, which allows line rate um, emission of packets, millions of packets per second, all done through software in user space. We've also been exploring frameworks for microservices development with products such as Shift and Mantle, making it easier for people to develop those new applications. And that's necessary because these applications are changing dramatically because of cloud computing and open source. A simple example here is that we're seeing DVRs moving out of our homes up into the cloud by most of the, the major cable providers as a better way to deliver the services to their customers. So in many ways, I think we're seeing a whole new landscape open up here around open source. And OpenStack is one of the key elements of that. In fact, uh, I think that it was mentioned yesterday by Chris Wright, in the Linux Foundation collaborative projects, there are over 30 projects now that are looking to work with OpenStack. And it's amazing to go to that conference and to talk to everybody. And we're all getting around together and we're saying, how can we work together? As we've seen the example here in this wonderful demo, we just saw that OpenStack running on top of Kubernetes with CoreOS. This shows we can really work together as a community of open source projects to create something even larger than OpenStack itself. And it's incumbent upon us to, I think, reach out and provide the leadership and, and the advice and, and working with these other communities to bring about that open platform that our customers want. So the community, of course, has been very hard at work. As we've seen over the years, we've grown in size and in scale and the number of contributors. And those of you who are new to the community, get active, review, and also have some fun. Because we also don't always take ourselves so seriously. And those of you who might remember this video, this was a rap song that we really was a cloud anthem around open source. Um, but one thing that we are serious about is that this is hitting the enterprise today. And OpenStack, in fact, I think is going to get back together and might be at one of our parties later tonight. So take a look for them. It's a wonderful video. It's on YouTube. Download it. It's great. So one of the things that was nice to see in the user study recently is that now we are seeing OpenStack truly move into production deployment. 65% are now in production. And it's clearly a multi-cloud world that we're seeing a lot of people now aren't talking about it as AWS versus OpenStack. They're saying AWS and OpenStack. They're saying Google and OpenStack. They're saying Microsoft and OpenStack. And that's because, as, as Craig, who you heard from earlier, said that OpenStack is really emerging as the standard for on-premise component of a hybrid cloud. So as we go forward, I just wanted to stress again the value of what we're seeing in open software, open platforms, and these open communities, because this truly is, is drawing upon our capacity for innovation and collaboration. Thank you very much.